the quality controls at labs. This is in any Dukin. You know, there are tens and tens of thousands of cases at enormous expense being rever reversed in Massachusetts because of two entire drug labs that had no meaningful quality controls. Uh, there was dry labbing where they weren't testing the evidence. Uh, there was widespread consumption by these two different examiners of the evidence. They were using the drugs rather than testing the drugs. Uh, but, but you don't have examiners that are using the drugs rather than testing them go undetected for years and years and years unless there's no meaningful quality control in place. If they had just done minimal spot testing, they would have caught this problem. But labs often don't do meaningful, minimal spot testing like any clinical lab is required to do. Any real lab, any hospital, anytime you get a COVID test or a strep test, their equipment is calibrated, it is tested, there is spot checking. And so you won't have years and years of errors accumulating before anyone realizes that there's a quality control problem. That's what real labs do, they are regulated. Crime labs are typically not regulated. If they are accredited, they still don't require auditing of casework as part of accreditation. It's a paper accreditation, which is good for the procedures to be solid on paper, but that doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the work being done. And to bring out the content of your lab's SOPs that bear on quality control, when that content may be very, very, very thin, can also be, be good because jurors may assume that a lab is like, like a real lab, when in fact crime labs are typically unregulated and there is no quality control. There isn't double checking of the work except often a verification by a colleague in a case, which often looks more like what happened in the Mayfield case where someone is seeing what someone else found and say, oh, you found a match? Oh, it looks like a match. Uh, it's not blind testing and it's not auditing, it's not sampling. Uh, an example of a single spot check that led to an entire lab being shut down was the DC lab, where after the case where uh, defense methods experts testified and raised all these questions about the reliability of firearms identification, and the judge uh, concluded that all you can say in a firearms case is that the, you can't exclude a firearm, uh, after that hearing and after that ruling in United States versus Tibbs, another firearms case involving two cases involving a shotgun that were connected and that uh, came before the same judge. And there it was actually the prosecutors, the US Attorney's Office, that were worried about being before the same judge. And just like, this judge is gonna hyper-scrutinize firearms. We know this judge is not on our side. So they asked an outside expert to review the firearms evidence. And the outside expert, who is, I think, retired FBI, looks at the, the shotgun casings and says, you know, I examined them under the microscope. These definitely didn't come from the same shotgun. And uh, the U.S. attorney is like, what? And so they have three more people look at it. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, th th this is a definitely an exclusion. These, these shootings are not related. And so they go back to the lab and say, uh, we did a spot check and uh, we're concerned. The lab then said, oh, well, you know what? We've, we've reexamined everything. And now that we've looked at it again, we actually, it's, it, we think it's inconclusive. And so... Now we're not right and we're not wrong because, as you all know, inconclusive means you can't be wrong. Well, actually, altering conclusions, although accrediting agencies don't do spot checks, if you alter conclusions, that, that can be the type of, of conduct which can have your accreditation pulled. Their accreditation was suspended. All work has, is, continues to be shut down at the lab. It then came out that the conclusion was changed inconclusive where you know, the examiner was brought into the supervisor's office and in the office typed out on the smartphone like, okay, I changed my conclusion to inconclusive. Um, it didn't take complicated digital forensics to, uh, anyway, they're basically people in the lab are told to alter their conclusions. And by the way, it's really easy to alter conclusions if nothing in your discipline is documented. It's not like you had to change your markings or your documentation. If it's all in your head, I've just looked at it and decided what it was, well, you can, you can re-enter your head and say, okay, now it's inconclusive. Uh, so the firearms unit is shuttered. Uh, we will see when the lab, if the lab regains accreditation for some of its disciplines, we don't know. But that was a single spot check. If that had happened years and years ago, I mean, there have been problematic testimony transcripts that I've read uh, coming out of that lab for years. And, and, there were, and there was no independent testing of this type. It happened by accident that a case was reviewed and led to this uh, understandable concern with the quality of the work done in the lab. Uh, but this is the type of report that we often get on the defense side, a report that basically has a one-liner saying, I found a match. No documentation, no way to look and see what did this person do. Now, in a state that has a federal type 702, where you're supposed to assess how well the method was applied to the facts, how can you assess that based on this? There is no documentation of what methods were used. 
what evidence was, was, was there. Uh, judges have often fallen down on the job of asking for meaningful discovery or insisting that work be documented in the first place so you can tell how good the work was. Uh, just a few more things and I'll stop. Uh, we did, by the way, just recently uh, do a study looking at firearms conclusion language, whether it's source identification or anyway, the, those different terms, uh, a reasonable ballistic certainty, didn't matter, jurors convicted equally in all those different conditions. The one that did make a difference was actually what the judge on the Tibb case ordered, which is the most you can say is that we can't exclude this firearm. It sort of wasn't a form of a match. That actually did impact jurors to hear that more cautious, non-matchy conclusion. Uh, I'm gonna skip some things. There, is, you know, there are very few labs in the country that actually do the kind of spot testing uh, that is really required to have a real quality program. One of those labs is the Houston Forensic Science Center, which integrates these kind of blinds throughout the process so that a fixed percentage of cases that everyone in the lab works on are tests. And they know that they will be tested from time to time. Uh, they get a little prize if they correctly guess that a case is a test uh, because you know, if they email the detective to ask follow-up questions, they'll get a response, even if it is a fake case. And so everyone knows that they're being tested all the time and that it's part of a quality culture, that you catch mistakes, Ideally, you catch them in fake cases so that they don't impact real ones, that everyone is being tested, and that that's part of making sure that there aren't problems somewhere in the process, whether it's with a particular person's judgment, with the evidence that's submitted, with the database search. Every step in the process, you want to test. Very